right, well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Emmanuel's Dinner Theater uh, that we have here going today. Uh, we've come to really enjoy uh, these Sundays where we get together, uh, and it's just easier for everyone, just so you know, so that we don't have to scramble afterwards and get the seats together. It's also a good place where you can sit and write and take notes and do all those kinds of things, and I hope you'll do that uh, in the course of our teaching and preaching, and you'll notice that in your... Uh, uh, bulletins. You'll find a space for taking notes. I hope you'll come with a, a pen or a pencil. Uh, some of you prefer to do everything online or in the cyber world. You can do that too. Uh, but whatever you uh, come prepared, and I'm expecting God to speak to us uh, in light of us opening his word, and I hope we're ready to listen. Uh, I've been praying for that here. Uh, one of the things I want to make you aware of, and I want to promo it here, this is uh, a, a notebook that we are producing uh, for our study through the book of Romans. This is something that uh, we have not done since I've been at Emmanuel, which has been well, it's close to 25 years that I've been at Emmanuel. We have never preached through the book of Romans. And any of you that know your Bible or you've read the book of Romans uh, would think, well, why not? It's the easiest book in the Bible, right, in terms of its kind of light and easy things. And it's exactly the opposite. It's a very rich, dense, but a very, very important document for us. And so we're going to be spending not only the fall, but next spring. Right now, our schedule is we'll finish up right around June. Uh, but that, that is if all things go as they're planned, which probably never happens. Uh, but that's what we're thinking about. Uh, but we want you to study with us. And matter of fact, we're going to encourage all of the one another groups that we're going to talk about here a little bit later. Pastor Steve's going to talk about them uh, to make room for reflecting on the book of Romans. Uh, and so if you're a member at Emmanuel, we would love for you to make sure that you pick up one. We'll have them here. We'll have them available to you. And we'd love you to have them. If you're not a member and you're going to come and you would like one, please feel free to pick one up too. Right? We're going to try to uh, even set up a table because we know some of you will be like me. You'll pick up your notebook and then forget it in the chair while you're having a conversation with a brother or sister, and then it'll be here for the, over the week. All right? But we're expecting you to come back and get it because you'll need it for study. Right? So I'm just promoing it here today, but it has a preparation for you to study the passage in advance of our preaching on it. It has a place for you to put prayer requests. Uh, we've listed a number of verses that we're going to memorize together as a congregation and also some suggested ones for you. So it'll help you all the way through. And of course, we're encouraging you in your own quiet time or your time with the Lord to make Romans where you want to kind of camp out over this next year. So be looking for these. These are coming. Sarah Mays has been putting these together for us uh, to get them together. And uh, this format, just so you know, some of you say, well, why isn't it a nice little compact thing? Well, one of the things we're going to try to do uh, is as we teach and preach, uh, we're going to make our notes available and have them hole punched and ready for you to put them into your uh, binder so that you can use them in groups, you can reflect on them with other people, those kinds of things. So please uh, take advantage of this as we look into the fall and we'll look forward uh, to uh, engaging the book of Romans together. So good to see so many of you coming back as college students. It's always good uh, to see uh, our own people after the summer of traveling and different things. Even my wife and I, uh, I don't know if we took a formal vacation this summer. We didn't do that. We visited daughters all summer. Uh, but that means that we were in Michigan. Uh, we love our daughter. That's the only reason we go to Michigan. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but we went to Michigan uh, to visit her. Uh, we went to uh, Iowa to visit another daughter. We went to South Carolina to visit another one and a new addition to the Kowser family. Uh, little Huntley is his name, Hunt for short. So we keep adding. Uh, many of you who know me know that my wife and I, we had four girls. And uh, now our grandsons, we have five grandsons. And so we're trying to balance out the equation on the other side. Uh, I think all of the women in my family are praying for a daughter uh, to come along. Uh, Rana said the other day, I think I'm just going to get rid of all my girls' clothes uh, that she has uh, because the boys are not going to wear them and we don't have any boy toys at our house, so we'll have to gather those. Well, I want to invite you to think with me today about one of the most obscure passages. Matter of fact, I often joke about this as a professor at Cedarville. I don't think I have ever heard a sermon on holy kissing, right? I've heard quite a few sermons on unholy kissing, uh, but I haven't heard any sermons, I think, on holy kissing. 
Uh, as a matter of fact, and it's an it's a interesting thing because in Paul's world, Paul the Apostle, um, almost every one of his letters end with a command to the church that he's writing to to greet each other with a holy kiss. So it's an interesting sort of thing. And uh, why is that there and what's going on and why would Paul encourage that? Um, and so we're going to look at that this morning. But before we get there, uh, I just want to bring us into the moment that we're in as far as a, a church community as we get underway. So all of us, we know that fall is upon us. Okay? Many of us uh, who are teachers and professors, uh, fall is upon us because our students are arriving or they have already arrived and we're back in the classroom. But fall for me is, is a season of contradictions, right? Now, it affects me as a professor, but also affects me as a pastor and, and, and as a dad because in the natural world, everything's slowing down. Right? The fall is the season of decline. Right? That's why we get the beautiful leaves and all those kind of things like that. So we're heading toward the stillness of winter. And along the way, the gardens stop producing. So I think the garden that uh, uh, Rana and Michelle were working together on, they cleaned it out just about yesterday. So the gardens are, are stopping producing, even though uh, Paul, where is he at? Paul Giroux, our, our church gardener, he brought in a big load today out here from the church garden, but the gardens are, are stop producing. The grass mercifully thins out and grows less. I like that. The days start getting shorter and the long cool down for the hot summer begins. Yet it's also the season for the start of the school year and for the kickoff of the church calendar. New grades, new teachers, new students, new potential, and new possibilities. And as the school year begins, so do all the cultural and athletic events that mark the school year, right? If you have a child and they're in school, then you've got some wonderful band concerts to go to and choir concerts, right? The epitome of culture, right, as you go there. Um, so you've got, uh, uh, um, at the church, on the other hand, new sermon series, a new focus, new Bible studies, new classes, new connections. And one of the things that we're celebrating as a body during the summer, while some of you were away, we retired our mortgage for our building, right? So, I mean, that's a, it's a huge clap uh, along with that. We retired that. And so on the other side of that, for us, it's not so much that, that we can break our relationship with the bank, which we're happy to, right? We, we appreciate them serving us all those years. We're happy that that's over. But really, it opens up new possibilities, new opportunities to invest in ministry and to look forward because we don't have to send our money in that direction. So... Uh, for Rana and I, and for us as a church family, while the natural world winds down in the fall, we are winding up. So today, we gather as a body preparing to wind up from our summer slowdown. Now, this may not be true for everybody. Some of you are looking at me as a professor, right? I get this all the time and say, I have never slowed down, right? You stinking guy who's been off for three months, right? I've never slowed down, right? But for most of us, in any event, we're back on. For our church staff, this, they're back online. Everything is, is busy. And so it's important for us as we get underway again that we talk about what's important. We talk about what's necessary, about who we are and the essentials that we need to protect in our own lives and our life as a congregation to keep our identity central. Who are we? What are we about? What's important? Where are we going? So here's some things biblically we know. I can draw on if you were there last week, right? Biblically, we know that we need to spend time with God. Every Christian in here, one of the, I don't care what your schedule is. I don't care if you're moving from a freshman to a sophomore, from a junior to a senior. I don't care if you're changing jobs. I think Courtney and John are changing jobs. I don't care if you're entering a new phase of your family life with a new child or whatever the case may be. One of the things that's essential to every transition, every phase of life is you need to make space in your life for God. You need to make space to listen to him from his word, and you need to make space to talk to him in prayer, right? That's an absolute essential. I don't care what the transitions are. We can't grow past that essential thing, right? I think Dr. White was getting after this. What did he say? Uh, no Bible, no breakfast, right? That's his little phrase, right? So the idea here is we need to make time, and it's not so that we're checking a box any more than I need to make time for my wife and say, okay, here's the... Five steps for a good husband. One, when you see your wife in the morning, say hello, right? I don't have a checklist like that that I go through every morning, 
right? Because I, she's not a box to be checked. She's my wife and my friend. She's the one that I love, and I want to engage her as a person. The same way with God. I don't check a box by reading some verse that somebody sends me. I get on my knees and say, Lord, I need you to speak to me. I need to hear you. I need to obey you today. I need to be corrected in my thinking. Lord, speak to me. Teach me. Right? As David said, open your law that I might see wonderful things in it. Right? So that's the idea. We need to make space for that. The second thing we know we need to make space for is we need to make space to gather. We need to be with each other. We need time of worship, teaching, and time of seeing, all right, of seeing one another and being seen. We just need to be together. We need to come and put our eyes on each other. We can't do this online. Thank God we have the provision online if somebody's sick and they have to be home or other things like that. But that's not the default. That should be the exception that we make when you can't be here. You need to be here so we can see you and be seen and so you can greet and be greeted. So we need that. We need that time of gathering. And that's important for our protection, for our blessing, but it's also a command that we're called to gather together. That's a part of us fulfilling our mission as God's people. We're on mission not only when we're sharing the gospel with someone, not only when we're discipling our kids in home, not only when we're trying to reach our neighbors, but the very act of gathering together is testifying to the reality of the resurrection. Why do we gather on Sunday? Because it's the resurrection day. We're bearing witness to the resurrected Christ. That's the whole reason why we come together. If Christ is not resurrected, this is a sad group of people. No hope, no purpose, right? Involved in something crazy for some reason, but no hope behind it. So we gather and we, we remind ourselves of the resurrected Christ, the power that delivers us and the power that sustains us and the power one day that will bring us home. Right? We come together Sunday for that, but we come together by our unity and by gathering together to declare that we are the people of God, to be a witness to the reality of God by our very presence and by the way we live with each other. Right? So we need those two things. So we need a time with God. We need a time to gather. But beyond that, right, beyond that, we need a time to truly engage with one another. And what I mean by that, you can't hear, I can greet people, I greeted a whole bunch of people when they came in today, but I didn't greet all of you because I couldn't make my way around or I had other things I had to do on the way here. But even then, those greetings were pretty short unless you were here really early, like uh, Courtney and John, I'm picking on them this morning. They were here really early, so I talked with them for a long time and, and badgered them for a while, uh, and they put up with it. But I got to talk with them, but most of you, it's just been, hello, how are you doing? It's good to see you back for some college students. But I don't know what happened in your week. I don't know as a college student whether this was a good summer or whether you're sitting here just loaded with guilt and shame. I don't know. I don't know if you had a great week with your marriage last week or you're just sitting here because it's an obligation, but you got daggers going between you and your wife. I don't know. I don't know what the issues are that are going on. And our time together doesn't allow us for that kind of connecting, right? It's not intended for that kind of depth so often. So we get to greet each other, we see each other. So we need another environment, and this is the third thing, right? So we need a quiet time, we need a time to gather here together. The third thing we need is we need a time where we can do some one another's. And that's what we want to talk about here. A place where you can know and be known. Right? So you can know and be known, truly know who you are and be known by other people, and you know them. So we need a space for that. And so we're going to talk about that, and what I want to talk about here to introduce us to the importance of that is to use Paul's little command to greet one another with a holy kiss to introduce the idea of the one another's that are the obligation and the blessing of the people of God obligation because it's a command but the blessing is right to be devoted to one another means that you have an obligation we're going to look at that in Romans 12 to be devoted to the well-being and furthering of God's blessing in another person but it also means that you enjoy the blessing of other people being devoted to you to be called to love one another means that you have the obligation to give of your best so that somebody else might have God's best. You have that obligation, but you also get to experience that in return. And so we want to talk about that as we set up the context for what we're going to call our one another groups. Now here is, whoops, I always need to turn this on. Uh, it never works without being turned on. 
Here are just the commands, and I'll just list them here, and we'll read through them quickly. Most of them are from Paul, uh, and then we have a few. One comes from Peter and one from John in the little epistle of 3 John. So here, Romans 16, greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ send greetings. This is actually one of my favorite passages in the New Testament for just humor. Okay, Some of you think, well, I don't think of the Bible as funny. Well, Romans 16 makes you aware of just the humanity of a book that most of us think of as a big theology book. But you get to Romans 16, and Paul greets everybody. And he goes on, I greet, you know, so-and-so and his mom, you know, and his dog and his neighbors. No, he doesn't say dogs. But he greets everybody and brothers and sisters and moms and everybody that he can think of, right? Some of them you don't know. He greets a number of hermeses. I don't know how many hermeses there were in Rome. but That seemed to be a prominent name there. But he's greeting all kinds of people. And then in a moment, one of the funny moments is Paul used an amanuensis. An amanuensis is a secretary that writes the letter for him. And so Paul, the book of Romans, he was quoting to a guy by the name of Tertius. And we don't know anything more about Tertius than the one verse we get in Romans 16, where right in the middle of Paul greeting everybody, it's almost like Tertius is there, you know, jerking on Paul's, you know, toga and saying, Paul, Paul, I want to say hi. And so he breaks right in the middle and he goes, I, Tertius, who wrote you this letter, greet you in the name of the Lord. And then, okay, Tertius, let's keep going, right? And so here's this guy there that wants to greet everyone. And then when Paul's done greeting everyone on his own, he sends greetings from other people with him to people who are there. And then he says, okay, everybody greet each other, right? So you've got that kind of environment that's happening here. And we get to the end of the book of Romans, we're going to find out how challenging that would have been in the setting of Rome. Okay? All the brothers are send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. The friends here send their greetings. Greet the friends there by name. Okay, now we're just going to break this down. And we're going to walk through it and say, well, what is it that Paul expects of the people of God? What is it that you would see? Why would you see it? Right. So as you, if you're looking at your notes, you'll see some blanks to fill out. Simple ideas to carry away. But let's begin here and talk about this command. See if I can get myself to move forward. I'm stuck here, Steve, for some reason. There we go. Okay. Now, so let's just pull it apart. The term greet. Uh, The term greet, kairain is the Greek term. Greet. Um, It's also the the verb that you get joy from. Right. So it has an idea of of some sort of positive interaction, right? It's not greet with a, you know, closed fist or greet with a glare, right? Any of those kind of things. The very idea of greeting has a positive thing here. But notice here, simply, it's a call to act. It's a call to initiate. You know, one of the things that that I have found in my own church experience, sometimes as believers, when people come to the church, they will come, and even if they're, they're, they're full-grown believers, they'll come to the church, and they will sit there and expect other people to initiate with them. Matter of fact, that may be their litmus test about whether this is a good church or not. And what Paul is saying here is that I'm called to initiate. I don't get to sit there and go sit at my table and wait for everybody to come greet me. I should be going after them. So it's a call to initiate a relationship with someone. It's actually moving toward one. It should be the case, right? If you stopped in here for the first time in Emmanuel, and you're welcome, so glad you're here, it should be that somebody went after you. If you came in here, it should be that you went after somebody. So it's a call to act, to initiate something. It's not a passive thing where you sit and wait to see if you get greeted. It's where you go after someone. Second idea It's an act of recognition and welcome. So here, right, we have, uh, I think, Levi and and Kristen just came back from a trip to uh, Italy. Let's all envy them and hate them for a moment. They just went to uh, Italy, had a great time together, uh, and they brought back some gifts to their children. That's why they're good parents. Uh, And Molly was describing the little, I think, a T-shirt or shirt that they got for her. And I said to Molly, I said, it sounds like somebody had you in mind when they made that shirt, as she described all the flowers and different things that were on it, right? Uh, The idea here of of greeting is you're recognizing someone. You're you're putting your eyes on them. All of you know 
one of the things that, that it, that's it's so important is just to have somebody walk up to you and look you in the eye that says, you matter. You're worth my time. I'm going to attend to you. Right? It, it, many, it, many of you that are parents, you know that you went to all kinds of events for your kids or you're still going to them. Okay? They're not the best athletic events you've ever witnessed. Right? Sometimes they're funny because they're so chaotic and so poor at doing what they're supposed to be doing. Right? So you're watching the little kids play soccer and it's a herd right, of little boys running around after the thing and nobody actually is playing their positions. Or the little girl sitting over there doing cartwheels in the back while everybody else is playing and everybody's watching the girl doing cartwheels. Somebody scored, well, who cares? Right? All, all those kind of things. Or you go to the concert. And all the kids are waving at the parents and everybody's out there and you're hoping your kids get and you can't hear your kids sing, but you've been there to do that. You go to a band concert. I think the ones that my mom and dad went to is I played trumpet, right? At my fifth and sixth grade concerts, they were they were painful. <laughs> painful concerts. Well, what what were you doing? I love you, I'm here. Many of you have gone to the hospital with people who really can't interact with you. And it's a complete ministry of presence. I'm here. You matter. I'm going to spend my time and life on you. Right? So it's an act of recognition and it's an act of welcome. I'm glad you're here. Right? I'm glad that you're here. So when you're greeting them, you're welcoming them in the room. You're acknowledging their presence. And this in particular, notice in John, he says, greet them by name. Okay? Now immediately some of you, right, Will Urschel, Will Urschel forgets everybody's name. Uh, he, he admits this, I'm not outing him on that, uh, but he will greet you enthusiastically and he does know you by face, he just may not be able to recall your name uh, in terms of that. But as you, as you go there, as you get somebody's name, I know how important that is to have names, for somebody to call you out by name, how that draws you up short, right? As a professor, uh, sometimes my students, when I'm on my game uh, and I see a student that I had like two years ago and I walk past and I say, hey, Jasmine. And almost always the person would go, you know my name. That's the response, not hello, you know my name, right? So the idea here is that when you come up and you get to know people's names, and, and this is, we'll talk about this, but you see a young person, an older person, when you go up and call them by name, that says something to them about your care for them. So this is about, so to greet, we're, we're initiating, and it's an act of recognition and welcome. All right, third thing, notice, greet one another. All the brothers send their greetings. Greet one another, greet one another, greet all, greet one another, greet the friends, okay? Now, here it is, is the simple one, everyone is to greet everyone, right? Now, sometimes, I, I know some of you have been a part of it, have you, have you been a part of a church that has a ministry where they have official greeters, Right? Some of us have been official greeters, right? where they're trying to say this is important, we want people to be greeted when they're coming in. Well, the biblical idea is that this is the greeting team. Everyone who knows Jesus, who's believed in him, who belongs to him, right? all of these, these commands are at the end of the letters that are written. They all assume the people have believed in Christ. They've known that they've sinners. They've accepted the fact that they're lost and helpless. They put their faith in Christ and they're being instructed as God's people on how to live as this new community that God's made possible, as he's recreated them. And so they're a group of people where I, I'm on mission. Now notice, okay, notice how this is. You didn't come to a service today. You didn't come to a meal today. You came to a group of people today. You came to a group of people. And, and your goal here is not, right, to get through the service or to say you win a service, but to meet the people that you came. They are the people that constitute the church. I know we say this, it's not the building, it's not the program, it's the people here, right? So we come, we come not to a service, but to a group of people. When you walk in, I don't care if you don't have any formal role up here. I don't care if you're not back in the booth or whatever you're doing. You're on mission because you're under obligation by the Lord of the church to greet the other people. To let them know that I love you. You're welcome. You're accepted. You're valued. Right? We're on mission. 
in terms of that. So I'm coming to them. So when I walk in, the person that I have been this past week, what's going on in my head, right? Those are all coming into play when I meet the people here at this. But I'm not coming to avoid people. I'm not coming here just to try to listen to the sermon and everybody stop talking to me, right? Don't talk to me. I'm not coming here just to get my kids in a program or just to do my ministry. I'm here to meet the people. Key idea. So everyone greets everyone. And then notice here, right? This is the controversial one. Right? Greet one another with a holy kiss. We got a lot of kissing going on right down through here. Kiss, 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 right? The Greek term is phile. Uh, very common. This is where we get friendship or thing like that. But a kiss is a phile. Greet one another with a hagia phile, with a holy kiss, right? So the idea here, and I want to say, Philip, use a community appropriate sign of affection. Now, it's been the teaching of the church all through that Paul's not giving a definitive mark of Christians, right? As if all the Christians down through the ages are marked by the fact that they're kissers. That's not true. Even in Paul's own time, Kissing was a, a very well-recognized way of greeting one another, a, an affectionate way of greeting one another. Okay. Very likely, in the setting where Paul is, it was women kissing women, men kissing men. Okay. Yeah, I did say men kissing men. I did say that. Right. Uh, but as a part of that Mediterranean culture, they greeted one another with a display of affection. Okay. Now, you can do that in a number of different ways. We were joking about this before as we were getting ready for this for the service, uh, I was introduced through my wife into an Italian family, and an Italian-Italian family. Her, her uh, grandparents came over and went through Ellis Island, uh, and they're about as Italian as you can get. It was Italia was her grandmother's name, uh, and her, her grandfather's name was Luigi, right? So Luigi and Italia Nardo was her family, uh, and her, her uh, dad was Raymond, uh, and a little bit, not with the Italian thing there, but they became, really, they wanted to become Americans when they came. So after her generation, Italia's generation, really Italian as a language kind of passed from them. But I remember meeting them for the first time, the whole extended family, and I had never been kissed by so many men in my life. Right, I just had not been kissed by them. And again, there was nothing feminine or anything about it Right, it was these big guys and, and her family, they're big guys. Her dad is a big guy. I've joked about that before. Ray, when he was here, I always joked about him. He looked like a mafioso Don, right? So he's got these dark glasses on. He's six foot three or four. His hands, when he would shake my hands, would just like, you know, I, I shaking, you know, a little kid's hands or something. Just a big guy. And they would come out and they would grab you on both sides of your head. Okay, so I got these guys that grab me on both sides, and then they would turn your head like this, right? So you need to get loosened up before you went to greet everybody. So, you know, the, that kind of thing, but, but it, was a, it was a sign of affection. And the women were coming over, Aunt Wheeze, or Aunt Louise, giving me the big hug, right? All those kind of things like that. Uh, it's just a part of it. And they were welcoming me into the family, right, in terms of that. And so it's interesting to think about wherever you were, in the first century world, you would see when Christians gather, you would see visible public displays of affection toward one another. Now, I want to talk about this a little bit later. Uh, these are house churches. So, it's, they're small gatherings. Everybody knows everybody in these gatherings. Think about how difficult it would be to harbor unforgiveness and anger and hostility when you came. Be obvious not only to you but to everyone else if you're avoiding brother rick which i try to avoid him on regular basis brother rick right over here so if you're avoiding him and you're trying to walk around him it's pretty obvious to everybody about what's going on right. so but it's a community appropriate one we're going to uh, get this a little bit more paul qualifies it here's a bunch of them that we use right in our culture and uh, we're going to talk about it's not only a community appropriate one but it's one that's appropriate to the nature of the relationship you have with the person that you're greeting. We're going to talk about that, right? So we got the old fist bump. We got a, a wave, right, a safe wave distance, right? Uh, we've got, uh, you know, grandma and daughter here hugging each other. We got the sister clutch over here, right on the left, right? Um, 
got the hand on the shoulder, got a, the one down here in the right-hand corner, I, I want to look here, is just looking somebody else in the eye and smiling. And just looking them in the eye and smiling and saying, you know, I'm just welcome. Right? I mean, that doesn't have to be any touch at all, but it's a difference between, we all know the difference between a glare and a smiling eye, right? Uh, a hug between brothers and a hearty handshake. Those are all different ways that we have it. Now here, I just want to say one thing. It should be a greeting that is recognized by all as an appropriate greeting so that the people should know what to expect. We should know what to expect from each other and we should know how to greet each other. This is why we don't have secret handshakes between subgroups at Emmanuel, right? Or you have to, you know, hit both sides of your hands and do all this and then jump up and bump your hips, right? We don't do that. We don't do those things. Why? Because we're not trying to exclude people with a greeting, and a greeting can wind up being an exclusive thing. What, you don't know the secret handshake? What, you don't know this, right? I don't know. And I'm telling young people and old, young people, as you're walking with the older people, if you're called to greet them, you need to think about the fact that you've got to cross generations. And older people, you're loving and learning your young people so you can figure out how to cross generations because you want to meet them. So we should know what to expect from one another. We should be able to participate. I shouldn't have to walk in and figure out, these guys are so weird, I don't know what to do to say hi to somebody. You should be able to know what you need to do. And so here it's a holy kiss. And so here it's express affection appropriate to family gatherings of moms and dads and sisters and brothers. Right? So the biblical analogy of our gathering together, this is a family gathering. This is a family gathering. This is moms and dads in the faith. And this is brothers and sisters in the faith. And when you gather as brothers and sisters, there shouldn't be any kind of sexual or sensual relationships that are happening in public. None of that should be happening. No woman should feel ogled or inappropriately touched or, or, or pursued in any event. This is not appropriate for a family gathering. So you do things that are appropriate for a family gathering. So for myself, this is very important for me. The analogy that, that Paul uses in 1 Timothy 5 to help Timothy navigate it, he says, treat older, da- older men like dads with respect. Treat older women as moms. Treat the women of your age and younger as sisters. Okay? Well, I have a sister. She's three years older than me. There, uh, we can be physical, but we all know the difference between a hug and a hug. Right? And my, as a man, I'm old school on this, and I think this is incumbent upon men, my cues come completely from her. So I don't want to throw myself on her. I don't want to approach her in a way that makes her uncomfortable. I don't want to do anything in terms of that. But with my sister, right, she, gives, she can give me a hug. Sometimes she'll put my arm, her arm in mine because of my biological sister, all those kind of things like that. But there's nothing sexual about that at all. And so it's appropriate for a family gathering. Right? When I greet my mom, I will hug my mom. My mom will hug me. She just accepts it. My mom's not as huggy as I am. She just takes it from me. She just kind of leans in and lets me squeeze her, okay, because she can't get away from it, right? But all those kind of things, as you get to know people, you have, you have a, a, a greeting that's appropriate for them. If I don't know the person at all, I'll just walk up to them and say, hello, I'm so glad that you're here. If it's a man, I'll offer my hand to him. To women, sometimes I don't offer anything, but I just want them to know. As I get to know them, then maybe the greeting changes over time. I'll pick on Mary Mays right here, uh, who's been a long-term friend of mine for many, many years, right? Me and, and the Mary Mays, we just go right in and get a side hug, right? I have known her as my sister or daughter in the faith for years and years and years. There's deep affection between us and her family, right? So, but it's appropriate. So you shouldn't have any kind of thing in here that's inappropriate in those. You should have a relationship. But you're looking someone in the eye, you're saying, I'm so glad here you're initiating it as you go now here's what i want to talk about some of you are saying but greg i'm an introvert okay you're not an introvert greg so it's easy for you to say now some of you I, I know this my my rana here uh this is nothing i'm not betraying any confidence here 
Rana really is an introvert. And so you say, are you talking about the same Rana? Yes, I am. Well, in, when she's in an environment where she's comfortable, she knows exactly what her role is and what she's doing. She's doing everything. And people think, wow, she's so outgoing. But when she's in an environment that she doesn't know what place she's supposed to play, right? Like you're not there. Well, then I, I, when we were younger, especially not so much now, Rana would be right here behind me. And one of the things that I would do that would really upset her is if I would start glad handing and talking to people and lose her in the crowd. And then I would go find her and she would say this, you left me. All right. So whatever, whatever, the, whatever the things are, right, in terms of, and, but, but notice here, this is an obligation on everyone. It doesn't have to do with personality styles, it, but it is going to be informed by it, right? Not everybody's going to greet everybody the same way, but we're called to greet one another. But Greg, that's so awkward. Well, I don't know them. They're an older person. What do I say to them, right? And that makes me want to be kind of facetious a little bit. Well, they're human beings, aren't they, right? I don't care if they're older human beings, Right? They're coming here, they love Jesus, or they have some sort of relationship with him. Right? They have common issues, and they need to be greeted and valued. I don't care if they're older than you. I don't care if they're married and you're not. I don't care if they're at the end of life and then you're just at the beginning. It's our responsibility. And I, I just put up, here's first century situations in home churches. Right? Awkward. Men and women. Now, I, I put men versus women here, right? We live in a culture that's trying to pit men against women all the time and vice versa. And if you've come from a background where you have been abused by a man, it's a little bit more difficult for you to greet men. I've had, I've had women tell me that as a pastor. It took me a long time, Greg, to trust you, trust a man in an authority position. Right, so it's, that's, a that's something to cross, right? You want to avoid men. You're suspicious about it. If you've been burned by a woman, you are, uh, I'm just going to watch myself. Right? So to cross those boundaries, slaves and slave owners. Well, you want to read about this, read in Colossians or Ephesians or the book of Romans when we get there, right? Or 1 Timothy where you've got people worshiping together and you've got slaves and slave owners. That's a bit of a boundary to cross to greet each other. And Paul's saying those old boundaries need to be broken down and now you need to come together and call each other brothers, sisters, brothers and sisters, Jews versus Gentiles, right? It's hard for us to get inside of the hatred that existed between Jews and Gentiles, right? The favorite description of the Gentiles, Paul gives us this you know, by the Jews and Philippians chapter 3, he called, the Jews would call the Gentiles kunas, dogs. And that's not like, you know, Lassie or, you know, some other quality dog figure, right? In the ancient world, dogs were just kind of vermin. Uh, they were kind of the scum of the society. They were things to be avoided, right? The, the key characteristic is given for us by Peter. They went back and ate their vomit. That's dogs. So that's the way you spoke about Gentiles in your home as you were growing up. That's the way Paul spoke about Gentiles as he was growing up. And then the Gentiles would respond, and they called the Jews the katatome, which is a play on the word paraptome. Paraptome is the word for circumcision. Katatome is they're just people that mutilate their flesh. They're flesh mutilators. All right, right? Sweet, you know, sweet things, right, that they would say to each other. Now, here they are. They've come together. They've believed in Jesus together. He's transformed them and made them a new people. And now they're supposed to call them, look over him and say, you're my brother. I value you. You're important to me. You're like a family member. Matter of fact, I'm called by Jesus to give of my best so that you can have God's best, even if it costs me something. Jews versus Gentiles, right? The rich versus the poor. Read in 1 Timothy or in Corinthians, right? First Timothy, you have women that are coming in that are very, very wealthy. They have elaborate hairdos, very expensive jewelry, and they're walking into their churches and declaring their status. And Paul rebukes them. Well, we're called to love across socioeconomic boundaries. I'll tell you this as a pastor over the years. The hardest divide at EBC is not racial. 
It has its complications. It's not men versus women. It's socioeconomic. Different cultures, different lifestyles, educational levels. And God says those do not determine who you greet. They don't determine who you belong to. They don't determine who you affirm and value. We're called to step across those. So everyone knows. So these situations today, what are our situations today? We have hardly anything compared to some of those, right, that are here. But we have some of the same old lines because of sin in our congregation. And I'm called to step outside of them. I'm called to go over and greet Clint Brads. You don't know how difficult that is to greet Clint. No, he's really a great guy. It's really easy to go over and greet him. I'm called to greet Mackenzie Gaines. I'm called to greet Dorcas Hilliard and Bill Shaw. And anyone who comes to this, I'll, I have to go after them. And some say, I'm not good with kids. Well, I don't care. I don't know what to say to older people. Get over it. Say something. Right? And what does it mean, too, if, we're, if we know the awkwardness of greeting, do not be the person that says, oh, we've already met. You should know my name. Shame on you. Shame on you for, for cutting somebody off at the knees who takes the initiative to make themselves vulnerable. Do you follow me on that? Right? You get, you get upset at people and you say, uh, you, you've introduced me once before. Yeah, one year ago, I met you once. Okay? You know what? That will happen that next time. That person will walk in here and say, I don't know if I'm going to greet somebody next time. I just got slapped. Right? I put my fist out and it just, mm, you know, mm, okay. Right? So d- this is called, we should be creating environments, right? Well, we expect the fact people will forget your name. People will be awkward. People will do those things. But we're trying to create an environment that encourages people to, to reach out to each other. So we need to be ready to do that. People will do it badly. You will do it badly. And if you don't get over that, then we'll just all stay in our safe groups. Right? You with me? Okay? On that kind of thing. Now, so here's bottom. If you're feeling this last thing. When believers gather, each believer has a responsibility to convey to all of their fellow believers that they accept, value, and love them in a way appropriate to the relationship they have with the believer they are greeting. Now, these are all the kind of things. So I have a responsibility. I'm coming in. I'm on mission. I'm, I'm here to meet this group of people. And so I'm on mission. And I'm looking to greet people. I want to look at them in the face. I'm not trying to avoid them, right? Uh, we all know how to do this, right? I'm a part of, of meetings all the time. You can come late to a manual and leave early. Right? And then some of you, I know some of you have to leave early. But I have had, as a pastor sometimes, I have run out into the parking lot to connect with people. Not because it's 15 minutes after the service is over. No, it's just because we just ended. And I just want to connect with them, right? Now, I've had those temptations. You can come late and not greet anybody, and you can leave early and not meet anyone, right? We know how to. You can walk in and out of this and smile at people, and people can perceive you as as friendly, but yet you're never known, nor do you know anyone. We know how to do that as adults, okay? So uh, a responsibility to all to accept, value, and love them in a way appropriate to that relationship. So I want to do that, right? So I'm looking at the door right here. So Tabitha is sitting here silhouetted by the door, right, that's in there. Tabitha is one of my daughters in the faith. When I greet Tabitha, I greet her in a particular way, and I greet Will differently, right, usually like punch him or something like that. Uh, Steve, I greet as a brother in the faith. My sisters, when I greet them, Right? Sometimes some of them, I just wave at them, stand next to them and say hello. Others that I know really closely may hug me. Right? All of those things, but they're appropriate to the nature of the relationship. But I want to greet everyone in terms of that. Now, I'm going to ask you to do an exercise with me here. So you've been listening to me. We're going to read through the one another, to greet one another with a holy kiss is actually only one of dozens of expectations and blessings that the body of Christ should entail. So I'm going to read the, the, the first line, the black lettering, and ask you to read the blue lettering underneath it. And we're going to work our way through and, and be prepared. There's like four slides of them. Okay? If you don't feel overwhelmed yet, just hold on. Right? Get there. Right? 
and, and this is why our one another in groups, the kind of things that, that, that is expected of the people of God, the blessings that are waiting for us as a part of the people of God, they can't happen on Sunday morning. They can't happen. And we need another environment for that to happen. So that's why we want to make it happen. So I'll read the first one, then you follow me. Okay? Love one another. Honor one another above yourselves. Build up one another. Accept one another. Greet one another. Serve one another. Oh, try to move me forward here. I'm stuck for some reason. Yep, okay. Uh, you guys start off. Be patient with one another. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Submit to one another. Look to the interests of one another. This one uh, struck me. I thought, did I put the same one twice? No. One of them is we're called to bear each other's burdens. This one is we're to bear with the person. Okay. Teach one another. Encourage one another. Stir up one another to love and good works. Employ the gifts that God has given us for the benefit of one another. Pray for one another. Now, before we get here, here's a bunch of one another's of things we're not to do to each other. Right? And most, most of them you'll recognize are the opposites of the positives. The first one, do not lie to one another. Okay, pause. What would that do to all of our relationships if those two things stopped? If you keep on biting and devouring each other, you will be destroyed by each other. Do not slander one another. And then together, don't grumble against each other. All right. I know that's none of you have ever struggled with any of those things uh, and grumbling uh, against the people in your life, but that's his call. So I'm going to ask uh, David and the team to come up and sing for us. And I just want to end, uh, before I turn it over, uh, with the little passage in Romans 16 that follows Paul's command to greet one another with a holy kiss. If you want to look it up, it's in chapter 16, verse 16, right down through verse 19. And I want to suggest to you that this is not only the mark of the people of God, this is what the community looks like. It's not only our obligation before God, made possible by the transformation that the Spirit has brought about, but it's necessary for our protection. We know that everything that's marked by the Spirit of God and God's work among His people will move them together in unity. That means that everything that the evil one will do will be marked by disunity and destruction and division. So notice what Paul says here right at the end, and I'll turn to the team. Verse 16, greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ send greetings. Verse 17, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them, for such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites by smooth talk and flattery. They deceive the minds of naive people. Everyone has heard about your obedience, so I rejoice because of you, but I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. So may God help us to take up the obligation and the blessing of one another in each other.